good to be with you folks here. May the, uh, may the fourth be with you. For those of us who are Star Wars junkies, uh, today is one of those days. And like Pastor Paris mentioned, we are in this series called Alive. And basically throughout this series, we're going to look at how uh, because the disciples were with Jesus for three years and they witnessed his resurrection, like him coming back from the dead, and that experience in itself radically changed the way that they lived their lives, that from it, they started to make a difference in the lives of not only the people around them, but make a difference in the, in the entire world as we know it. And what God did through them in that moment uh, thousands of years ago is still happening today. And so we're going to look at what God did first in their hearts and so that we can understand those principles there. But also we want to learn from what God was doing through them in the process. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, Acts 1.8, that's what we're going to be in. And this is one of Jesus' last words before he ascended back into heaven. So he went to the cross, he died for us, he rose again, and he was hanging around for 40 days. And then after that, he basically ascended to heaven. So if you were to search for the bones of our risen Messiah, you can't find him anywhere. Why? Because he is not dead. He is alive. So Acts 1.8, one of the last things that he says to us is this. You will receive power. And that Greek word is dunamis, meaning strength, power, and ability. So you will be receiving strength, power, and ability to do this. When the the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses— Witness is this Greek word called martus, basically means this, one who was a spectator of anything, but also later translated as this, that one person who had such a powerful experience of Jesus that they were willing to die for him, meaning this is where we get that word martyr from. And so you'll be able to be my witnesses in three places, in Judea, in um, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're going to look at just this short little passage, pull some principles that we can apply to our lives so that we can live alive because Jesus is alive. Why don't you join with me as we pray this evening? God, we thank you so much for who you are, Lord. We thank you that you are alive, and in you, Lord, we become alive as well. And God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would speak, Lord, to our hearts here this evening. Whatever we're facing, whatever we know, we're going through, God, you know it. Lord, you know everything, and we pray that you begin to take this general word and speak it specifically to our current situations so that we can see you, trust you, and live our lives in awe of who you are. So, Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is soft and open to receive anything and everything that you want to deposit into us this evening. Lord, we thank you that this message is true, Lord, that you are alive and that we find our life in you. So we thank you for all that you're doing. In your beautiful name we pray, amen and amen. The title of my message tonight is this, Purpose Living. Purpose Living, I'm around uh, young people a lot, and there's this phrase that they say, um, and it goes like this, uh, if it's not on video, it didn't happen, meaning this, that if you were ever to Talk about a situation that happened to you in your life. If you don't have a category of way to show someone your experience, if you don't have it on video or a picture of it, then it basically didn't happen, meaning this, that they want to see it in order to believe it. And this happens in pretty much every area of our life. And so I remember when I first got into CrossFit, I was trying to learn all these new movements, and you're looking at me saying, like, I don't think you work out. Okay, Um, believe what you think. They're like, seeing is believing. I should see it. Okay, I'm working on it. Um, But I remember when I first started CrossFit, I was learning all these new movements, and one of the movements is this thing called the handstand walk, basically, where instead of walking on your feet, you're using your hands to walk. And so I was trying to learn how to do this, and my goal was to learn it to the point where I can walk from basically one end of the stage to the other end of the stage. That was kind of like the length of the the gym at the time. And so every single day, let me tell you this, I was practicing trying to handstand walk. And I would get, you know, I would get certain length and then I would fall. And then my goal was to make it all the way across in one attempt. And so there's this one time where I did it. I actually went from one side of the gym and handstand walked all all the way to the other side of the gym, and I fell down. I jumped up. I was so excited, and I was trying to see if anyone saw it, and there was nobody in the gym. (laughs) Nobody in the gym. So I'm trying to look for witnesses to verify that they saw me walk on my hands from one side of the gym all the way to the other, and no one was there. No one saw it. And so I'm telling people after, yeah, I walked across the gym, um, handstand walk, and all the other people in the gym was like, yeah, yeah, right. You have a video? It's not on video. I don't believe you. 
And I was so discouraged because in my mind, I know, and I kept saying, no, Jesus saw me walk. <laughs> Lord, you've seen everything. You saw me. I'm not lying. Why would I make this stuff up? And when we think about this, a lot of times, for many of us, we, want, we have this mindset that seeing is believing. Like, in order for me to believe in something, I need to see it with my own eyes. And when we think about the disciples, they were the first witnesses or people who experienced Jesus. They lived with him for three years. They got to experience him personally for three years. And then when he died, they witnessed that as well. And then for three days... He was dead. He rose on the third day, and Jesus started to reveal his resurrected self to specific individuals. He hung around for 40 days, revealing himself to people to let them know that this Messiah that you saw get crucified is not dead anymore. He is alive, and that experience when people started to see for themselves that he was risen, that radically transformed them in how they saw themselves, but also how they began to live their lives. The disciples started to live differently. Now they had a purpose in their life. Now they had some significance to their existence. Why? Because Jesus is alive, and through that experience, they found life in him. And some of us here this evening, you're trying to figure out what your purpose in life is, what the reason you are here for, and let me encourage you with this that God has a plan and purpose for your life. And three things, because he lives and because Jesus is alive, I want to look at this evening to encourage us in our walk with God. First thing in your notes is this, because he lives, first thing is this, we live with purpose. We live with purpose. You and I have a purpose now because Jesus is alive. In Psalms 139, 16, it says this, you saw me, the psalmist is talking about God, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had even passed. With God, there is no such thing as accidents. We were all created on purpose for a purpose. Your parents may not have planned you, but let me tell you this. God had planned you for your life. I just met with a guy this week in group, and he told me this, that his parents spoke to him at a young age that we didn't even want you. And so he's battling with this sense of significance because the people who brought him into this world were the first people who actually spoke death over his life. And I was trying to encourage him, tell him this, no, 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 no. Your parents may not have planned you, but God planned you, and he has a plan and purpose for all of our lives. And that's the truth about who God is and who God wants us to be. And here's the reality for many of us is this. We either don't know what our purpose is or we don't believe that we have a purpose. We're trying to figure out what this idea of purpose is. And some of us here don't even think that we have a purpose. I want to encourage you to know this, that we do have a purpose, and it's found in God. And if we don't, if we're not fully aware of the purpose that God has for us in our life, this is what's going to happen to us. Proverbs 29, 18 says this. If people can't see what God is doing, here's what happens. If they're not aware of who God is and what he's doing in their life, Here's the result of that. They stumble all over themselves. How many of us find ourselves stumbling in the area of our finances, stumbling in the area of our relationships, stumbling in the area of values and priorities in life because we don't know who God is? And if God is not clear to us, the result is clear. We're going to begin to stumble all over ourselves. And some of us have a story where we were trying to figure this thing out and making all the mistakes because we are doing it on our own. And so here's what the truth is, but when they attend to what he reveals, meaning this, if we are aware of who God is and what he's doing and what he sees for our lives, the result of that is this, they are most blessed. And the word blessed here is not just this idea of financial prosperity or good health and open doors, and that's all a result of God as well, but this word blessed literally means this, that the void in their heart is filled that this sense of significance, this emptiness in our souls, that you will find contentment in God and what he has for us in our lives. So that's really the idea biblically of what blessed is, is that we have now contentment and security and significance in who we are in God. But the irony is this, many of us are falling and settling for so much less than God's best for our lives. Why? Because we're trying to figure this thing out on our own. And so the disciples, they had first witnessed God resurrecting Jesus Christ, coming, dying, 
being raised to life, and through that experience, that unlocked a deeper sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. They found their significance. Their significance was now based on telling everyone about what they've seen and heard. And if we were to encourage people tonight, if you want to know really what your purpose in life is this, basically experiencing God for yourself and telling people about him. Because we can't tell other people about experiences that we've never experienced. So we need to experience God for ourselves. The more we get to experience about God, the more we get to share about God to the people around us. Because we're telling them what we first experience ourselves. So our result of our purpose in God is this. It's knowing him, not in our mind, but in our heart. Knowing God in our mind, not in our heart. And the more we know him, he begins to reveal our purposes for our life And purpose with God is this. It's a direction, not a destination. Purpose of God is this. It's a direction that we walk in, not a destination that we arrive to. Some of us, we're just thinking that I'm going to find my purpose one day, like it's this place that we automatically find. But really, purpose is just a pathway that we begin to walk on, and the direction is God. And the more we begin to follow God in our lives, the more he begins to reveal his plans and purposes for our life. And so purpose is the direction, not a destination. You know, in the mainland, they have this thing called greyhound dog racing. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that before. And I think I have a picture of what it looks like. It's basically like horse racing, but for dogs. And so in order for them to get the dogs to race, they have this mechanical rabbit that's on this pole. And what the rabbit does, it goes ahead of them. And the dogs are chasing after the rabbit. And so basically they'll blow the gun. The rabbit starts taking off. The mechanical rabbit, it's not real, it's a mechanical rabbit. The rabbit starts going and the dogs are chasing after this mechanical rabbit. And I've heard a story that on this one particular occasion, they had a malfunction mechanically and the rabbit exploded. So you got fur, fake fur everywhere. You got wires exploding a big bunch of smoke, and when the rabbit exploded, the dogs reacted differently. Some of the dogs just stopped and took a nap right there on the, on the race. If I was a dog, I would do that. I'll just be taking a nap right there. Why am I running? I'm not chasing after anything. Some of the dogs, uh, they got off course, and instead of running after the, the rabbit, they started to run off the track and got injured running into things that were the fences and the poles that were around the track. They ran into those things, injuring themselves. And then other dogs just stopped, looked at the crowd, and started barking at the crowd. Woo! Barking at the people who were watching the race. And I thought about that, and I thought it was so significant to somehow uh, how we live our lives, that if we don't have a purpose that we're running after, or if we're not walking in the direction and running after the things of God, the result of our lives is exactly the same. We either take naps, start hurting ourselves, or start barking at other people in our lives. How many of you have been there before? You just start complaining at other people because we are unaware of the purposes that God has for you and I. So this direction that God has for us is him at the forefront, and we're pursuing the things that he has for our life. And the more we begin to pursue God, the more he begins to reveal the things that he has in store for you and I. So our purpose begins first and foremost with knowing God not only in our mind, but experiencing him in our heart. Second point in your notes is this. We make a difference by serving and praying for those around us. We make a difference by serving and praying for those around us. So the disciples, after this experience, they began to tell their people around them about this experience of Jesus because when he resurrected, when he died, it was kind of a... pretty much a well-known event, and uh, most people didn't see him resurrect, so the people who had first-hand experience of him being alive after started to tell people that the guy that you thought was dead, he is now alive, proving that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is our Savior. And in Acts 4, 32 to 35, part of them telling the world about this experience is seen here. All the believers, those who have experienced Jesus for themselves, were one in heart and mind. There was a unity among the people. Uh, No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. Nobody said that this is my stuff, this is my money. They were thinking this way. They were thinking kingdom. This is our money. What can we do with this? My resource is not just for me, but it's for us. What What do we want God to do with our resources? But they shared everything that they had. 
There was just a common unity of not only a mind, but also a unity in possessions. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that here's my best part, that there there were no needy persons among them, that they were meeting the needs of the people in the community through the love and the power of Christ in their lives. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. There was just a radical sense of generosity. They weren't thinking about themselves, about what I can get for me, but they were thinking about, what can I give to see this gospel, this real news about Jesus being alive? What can I give to see this thing advance to impact other people's lives? And so the disciples literally started to make a difference in the lives of people around them, and they did two things. They served them, and they prayed for them. Basically, what God is asking us to do when it comes to sharing people about this experience that we have with him is to either do two things, to serve them and to pray for them, to serve people and to pray for people. Serving shows them that our message is not only talking about love, but it's displaying that love in our lives. So often we get to settle for just saying and telling people about the love of Christ that we don't actually show them that love of Christ in our lives. And so we not only need to tell people about God's love, but we need to show them by serving them. And then praying for people invites the power of God to prove that he is real and that he is powerful, that he can do all things. And so as believers... When it comes to us experiencing God for ourselves and trying to share this experience with other people, because this is a life-changing message, we do it in two practical ways. We just serve people, and we look for opportunities to pray for people. Serving and praying is two simple things that made a huge and profound impact. And if you read the book of Acts, you can just see miracle after miracle Serving after serving, people being drawn to God by what they see, but also by what they experience. And this radical transformation in their lives resulted in the community and the people around them not having any needs because God was meeting their needs to the love of Christ in their lives. And in Acts 1.8, you see three different cities in which this was displayed. And I have a picture of this, of Jerusalem here is in the middle, and that's where all the believers were gathered. And in the surrounding city of Jerusalem was these two cities called Judea and Samaria. It was just literal around, around Jerusalem. And then the verse also says to the ends of the earth. So meaning this, that we start from inside, people closest to us, and then we start loving people there. Then we start loving people in our communities around us. And then we start taking that love and taking it to the world. So literally, this is what you, you can see, is that our Jerusalem is this. It's my world. Go to the next slide. Jerusalem is my world. It's those closest to me, people in my life, the people that I see on a day-to-day basis, starting with your family, maybe the people that you live with, the people that you work with. If you have kids that are involved in sports and you're seeing other parents, that becomes your world. Your sphere of influence is your Jerusalem. And then your Judea and Samaria is basically this. It's beyond your world, meaning close to you but different than you. Close to us, but different than us. Meaning that there's some people that we wouldn't necessarily hang out with, but they're kind of like in our outer vicinity. You see them not uh, uh, consistently, but you see them occasionally. And then we need to take this love to people who are in that outer sphere of our lives. The, the people that you see once in a while. The people that you gather for maybe like a classroom uh, class reunion or so forth. Like these people in the outer area of our life that we don't see on a consistent basis, but we see them occasionally. We need to start taking this love and sharing it with these people as well. And then the ends of the earth is this. It's basically the world, those who are far from us. And so what God is saying is this. He was encouraging the disciples to do this. Don't just stay to the people that are closest to you, but take this message to the people around you that are first near to you, around you, and then people that are beyond you in your life. Meaning this, that every single interaction that we have with people is an opportunity to express the love of God to them. And the first place that we should start with is those that are in our immediate circle, those who we see on a consistent basis. And all of us here... There are people in your life today that you see 
on a consistent basis. And what God is saying is these are the first people that we should start immediately loving on. And for us as a church, we do this corporately as well. And one of our spheres of influence that's kind of been a part of ProSide since the beginning has been a sphere of just young people. And back when we started meeting in Momilani, Pastor Norman felt led to start an evening service there. And the intent was to reach young professionals who work during the day. And when they launched this evening service, instead of reaching young professionals, we started reaching young people, like high school street kids. And that's kind of been our DNA from the get-go. We were just, God has graced us as a church to have just an openness to reaching young people. And that DNA has not changed since the beginning. And so for us as a church, one of the corporate ways in which we can start to impact our world is influencing the area of young people. And uh, I have a picture here of one of our evening services. And in this picture, you just see uh, one of our evening services. This is all young people. And in this picture, you see some of the people who are leaders in our church today. You see Pastor Tim Ma rocking that white hat in the front row. You see Pastor, uh, Pastor Tim Ma is our site leader at uh, Cityside. You see Pastor Ki Omo, who is our site leader at Kaneohe. You see uh, Pastor Norman's daughter, uh, now Pastor Billy's wife, Naomi, in the front row there. And also in this mix, you had uh, Wade In, who now oversees our Kapole site. You just see all these young people getting reached who are now leading the church today, which means this, when you reach them young if you get God into their hearts at a young age, they can grow up and to become the person that God has called them to be. And a lot of the people who are leading you today, I'm as rich as a college student. I didn't come in this wave. They weren't reaching good schools back in the day. That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> I told that to Pastor Norman. He's like, yeah, we were, you know, we were reaching Pro City. I was like, yeah, you guys didn't get out to St. Louis. That's the best school. You got to get to the best. Anyways, bad joke, bad joke. But I was reached as a college student, as a, as a 21-year-old, coming to a, a relationship with God through this church, and, and now I'm, I'm helping out here, a, a part of the Grace family, meaning this, that there's power in reaching young people, and if you can get them at a young age, what God can do in a person's life. If I were to ask every single one of us here a question, who know God, who've grown, uh, who've come to a relationship with God, if I were to ask you this question, many of us would say this, I wish I knew God at a younger age. If I were to ask you, what is one thing that you wish were different about your life? Many of us would say this, I wish I come to know God earlier in my life. Why? So I don't have to go through the, all that I've gone through. That maybe if I came to know God at an earlier age, the truth of that experience could have altered my life. But, you know, a lot, God allows things to happen for a reason. But for us, the reason why we are so adamant about reaching young people is this, it's preventative. Other churches have a unique call to do other things in the community. And when it comes to us, they think, why aren't you guys doing this and this and this? And not that those things are wrong, but this is just our God-given assignment, which is this. It's preventing people from going down the wrong path so that later on in life, we don't have to do all these other ministries if we can get them at a young age. Now, through God, they can start heading in the right direction and that we will prevent them from experiencing all the things that they shouldn't have experienced because that was never God's plan for their lives. And a person who really embodied this is a guy named Alan Sue. He came to know God through our church as a high school student at Puno, Puno High School. And we love Puno as well. Um, but really, through his life, he actually was at a point where he wanted to do a school shooting at Punahou and take a look at his story on screen to encourage us about the power of reaching young people. I wanted to just end it all and share the truth of you live, you die, and that's it by trying to just kill as many people as I could. And I was actually planning to do a school shooting at Punahou before I graduated. But um, thankfully, someone invited me to small group. When I went to small group, it just really piqued my interest because I was going through all of these things. I was suicidal, depressed, homicidal, just so angry. And when I went to, to group, it seemed like these people had all the answers. Maybe not the exact answer that I was looking for or that I was searching for, but they had something that I knew I didn't have. And so it just, I just kept going. And group after group, time after time, discussion after discussion, it was the same thing. They knew 
me without knowing me. They knew my heart without even knowing who I was. And so I went to the Friday night youth service and it was weird because it was like the same thing. It felt like me, the pastor and something else. Now I know it was the Holy Spirit ministering to me. But at that point, I was so confused because it felt like the person speaking was speaking directly towards me alone. And every time I went, it was the message was about me, about the questions that I didn't even know I had. And it just just struck me that something is different about this place. Something is, is real here. And I think actually, so I kept going for a couple of times, a couple of weeks. And then actually you were preaching, Bill. I think it was uh, April 30th, 2004. The message was faith for your future. And uh, you said, one of the things I will always remember for the rest of my life, Jeremiah 29, 11, how it talks about God has a plan for you, a hope for your future. And he knew you before you were born. He knew you in the womb. And it finally struck me that I'm not just random chance. I didn't evolve into the human that I am now, but that God knew me from the very beginning. He had a plan for me. There's a purpose that I'm alive. There's a reason that, that I've even gone through the things I've gone through. And so you just hear from his story that he went from not knowing any idea of who he was as a person, depressed and wanting to not only end his life, but take out as many people as possible to coming to experience the purpose that God has for him through a small group. And then through that, God began to work on his heart, changing it from the inside out. And here's the great thing about his story is this. Now he's a missionary in Japan, reaching out to college students there, basically taking what God has done first in him and now taking it globally to impact Japan, which is one of the nations that have the lowest amount of Christians percentage-wise in the world. And so for us, you see that this message of God has global impact, that you can impact a person's life. And how many stories of people that encounter God at a young age how many stories were radically changed that we didn't experience the bad part of their story because God started to do something in their heart, that we were avoiding having stories here locally of a mass shooting here because the power of God was reaching these broken young kids at a young age and changing their story of their lives, altering the trajectory of the purposes that, it, that, they have, that God has for them. And so this message of God is so real, and one of the spheres that God has called us as a church is to organizationally make an intentional effort to keep on reaching young people. And with this in mind, as one of this becomes our, our sphere, knowing that we are currently starting to begin process within the summer runs, is we, we value kids so much that in the months of the summer, we're going to actually complete the build-out for our kids' area. Pastor Paris is going to mention that even further later on in the service. But we're basically going to begin to see that we're going to intentionally show that we value them, by putting finances to create a space for them to encounter God and also grow in relationships with other people. Other things that we've been talking about as a staff is that we want to have a youth community center so that we're not only just impacting church kids, but we want to impact the community and be a space for the community to gather around because the closer that they can come to us, the more, uh, more, more we'll be able to reach them and love them with the love of Christ. And so these are some plans that we're formulating and praying and believing God for open doors in the future. So that's organizationally what we're going to do. But individually, here's what we can do. We can meet the needs of the community by doing this. Start with someone who is far from God but near to you in your life. Because this is a muscle that all of us need to grow in, meaning this. All of us, our default mode when it comes to life is just to think about me. What's in it for me? What's my best interest? And all of us, even the best of us, we can easily slide into this me, myself, and I mode. And we need to constantly remind ourselves that it's not about you. That yes, God loves you, but he wants to experience he wants others to experience his love through our life, meaning this. It's not about us. That our story is not the end story. And so often when it comes to church, we can immediately just in, go to what's in it for me. I want them to sing my worship songs. You know when it comes to people who encounter God, the music at the time in which they encountered God, they remember that for the rest of their lives, meaning this. They want to sing those songs forever because those were the times where they really felt close to God. And then they hear the new worship songs today and they're like, ah, I don't like that. It's, 
Let's go to the old worship songs, you know. But really, if it's not about us, we want to sing songs that have the most relevance to the people that we're trying to reach. Because at the end of the day, what is it about? It's not about me. It's about God reaching people. And whatever song is reaching people, we want to sing that there. It might not be your song, but here's the truth. It's not about our songs. You can sing your own song to God in your own time. But corporately, we want to make sure that this place is a place for as many people as possible that can encounter God's love. So for what do we do individually? Just start with one person. Just start with one. Because it's a muscle, we need to grow in this muscle. We just start with one person. And here's how we can do it practically. Find out where they hurt the most and then help them there. Find out what they're hurting the most and what their need is and then serve them and pray for God to meet that need in their lives. Two practical things that all of us can do. You don't need to be a pastor to do this. In fact, all of us should be able to do this. Just serve people and pray for them and trust God at work in and through all of our lives. As the keyboard comes up, last point in your notes is this. We value what God values. Because he lives, we value what God values, and what God values is this people. God values people, so people become our priority. Why? Because people are his priority. And the resurrection of Jesus proved so true, and it showed us that God values us, so much so that he was willing to die for our sins. That's how much God values you and I, that he was willing to sacrifice his son so that we can have a relationship with him, meaning this, he was willing to go the distance for us because he loves us. And if God loves all of us, not just us here in church, not just us who know known God for years, if God loves everyone, then those of us who first experience his love need to make it our priority to share that love with as many people as we possibly can. That would, that's become our life purpose, to share God with as many people as possible because he not only loves us, he loves everyone, and everyone needs to experience that love for themselves. And many times we just think, God just loves me individually. Yes, he loves you, but he values everyone. And oftentimes we forget that it's not about us. And so God has to get our eyes off of ourselves to see that there's a world around us that has yet to experience his love And what God wants to do is use us to be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope to them so that they can experience his love through our lives. And 2 Corinthians 5 says this. This is an amazing verse. It says this. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah or united with God and Jesus, there's the result of that. You get a brand new start, a fresh start, and it's created new. The old life is gone. So when we come into a relationship with God, we get to start all over. We get to experience a brand new beginning. The old life is gone. A new life burgeons. Basically, a new life begins. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other, with one another. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, through his son Jesus, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God had given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. That's our task, to tell everyone what he's doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to what? Persuade men and women. We need to persuade them to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. And here's our message. Become friends with God because he's already a friend with you. That's our message to the world. We need to befriend the world so that they can become friends with God. Because we have a relationship with God, it's obligation out on our part to tell as many people as we possibly can about Jesus and allow the power of God, because he's alive, to bring life to their souls that would change the trajectory of their lives. Um, you know, I've been in this church for years, and part of what I do on a daily basis when it comes to working for the church, a lot of people are like, what do you do as a pastor? You guys just pray all day? And no, I don't pray all day. Prayer is part of it. 
<clears throat> but a lot of what I oversee is a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, the tech stuff, and a lot of these things that we need to do on a planning basis for week to week so that we can create opportunities and environments for people to encounter God on a weekend basis, not just here, but all across our locations. And a lot of the day to day is just the grind of getting stuff done. But my highlight is not going to work. Uh, my highlight is uh, just this meeting that started to happen for about a month now. And uh, me and my fiance, soon to be wife, uh, we kind of uh, have this partnership where uh, she's reaching a bunch of her friends. And part of my role is to uh, go with her to events and parties so that I can reach the other half of the person that she's friends with. And so she has a bunch of high school friends that she's friends with to this day. And I go to a lot of baby parties. I don't even like kids that much. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I'm going to these babies parties. And the reason why we're there is because it's her friends. And she wants me to go partner with her to reach people. And so uh, one of the, we, we, we tag team on this. And so she go and introduce me to the other half. And then I'm over there trying to befriend them. And they ask me what I do. And I say I'm a pastor. And it immediately changes the conversation. Um, but in this process, one of the reasons why I, I was attracted to her is because I knew that we could do this together. And so this one particular couple, she introduced me to a friend. And then I got introduced to the boyfriend. And they were coming occasionally to church. And then we were hanging out with them. And the funny thing is that they ended up breaking up, but I still had a relationship with this guy, and he was coming to our church. And uh, I knew that they broke up, and I just felt like a, a prompting in me to just take him out to breakfast one day because I just knew that he was trying to figure some stuff out. And so I said, hey, man, you want to meet up? I texted him, and he was like, yeah. I was like, I'm going to treat you to breakfast this one day. So we went to Zippy's, uh, the most holy place to have encounters <laughs> with people. And so I bought him breakfast, and over breakfast, I was just talking to him about where he was at in life and just talking about life and uh, the thing that I realized about him is he had no church experience. This whole church experience thing just started because of this relationship. He had no prior growing up, being in church, exposure to anything. So this whole God thing was brand new to him and I realized that, man, this guy has no idea who God is but he's open to it. And so I said, hey, you want to meet up next week? We can do this book called The Purpose Driven Life. And he was open to it. I said, I gave him my bottom up book. I said, hey, this is going to be something that we go over together. And then the following week, he said, hey, can I bring my friend? A friend has kind of been in and out of church. He's not in group, but he's open to coming. I said, sure, bring your friend along. And we just started meeting together every Tuesday morning, talking about life. And my role is to love on them and show them how much God loves them. And let me tell you this. This is the highlight of my week. Like, I leave these conversations just so thankful, not only that I have a relationship with God, but the privilege that I have to share him with other people. And this is literally, like, every Tuesday I'm excited. We're going to Zippy's, not to eat Korean chicken or anything like that, but to really get to talk about God to people who are open to him. Highlight of my week. And for all of us, God is looking for us to get beyond ourselves to look for people who are around us who have no idea of the hope that we have in God, but he wants to use us to encourage them, to inspire them, to serve them, to pray for them, and to believe for God's best in their life. We can't save people, but God wants, us to, wants to use us to share about him, and he does the saving in our lives. And who gets the glory? He gets the glory. He gets the glory. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in all of our lives, God. And we thank you, Lord, that it is a privilege for us to not only know you and experience you, but, Lord, it becomes an obligation on our part to tell as many people about you, God. And, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us, God, if we may be gone inward and we come into this place in our life where we're thinking it's, what about me? What about my life? What about my needs? What about the things in my life? And it's not that you're less concerned about that. But oftentimes, God, you want us to see beyond us because the fulfillment in life doesn't come by us getting our needs met. The fulfillment in life comes from knowing you and being a part of what you want to do in us to share you to the world around us. So, God, we ask for forgiveness as a church if maybe we've just been about us and our own business and not about your business. And so, Lord, we ask for just a realignment in our life this evening. And for those of us who have yet to know you and maybe are journeying along 
in this walk of faith, God, we pray that you would reveal yourself afresh to them. God, we thank you, Lord, that you not only want us to know you with our mind, but you want us to experience you in our hearts. And I pray right now, Lord, that the power of God, the love of God that we talk about, Lord, that would be radically displayed to your spirit right now, that you would just fill every single heart here who is searching, who is opening, open, who's maybe seeking but not knowing what they're looking for. God, I pray, Lord, that that space in their heart that's a void, God, that your spirit will fill that and that they will know who you are and come to an experience of that and that would change them from the inside out. Lord, we thank you that this message is alive, that you're not dead, and through you we can have life and life to the fullest. So we give you our hearts here this evening. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen.